today we're talking about empowering young people through coaching and literacy and I'm thrilled for this episode because today's guest is an amazing woman that I first met through Toastmasters actually and uh, since then I've worked closely with her and seen her phenomenal growth as she transitioned from working uh, for the education department to starting and then quickly growing her own successful business support to excel and Sonia Tadio is a teacher who specializes in literacy, helping young people from reception to year 12 students and beyond. And she really believes that everyone has the right to feel empowered and with the right mentoring, support and coaching can really achieve their personal best in life. Hear, hear to that, I say. Now, mm -hmm. Sonia is a very special lady. She has a master's of teaching, specializing in early years. She also has specialist training in helping people with dyslexia and literacy and is continually, continually learning and on the leading edge of development in this space. Uh, Sonia is also an internationally accredited master in NLP, timeline therapy and hypnosis. She's a woman of many, many talents and I can't wait to hear more all about um, Sonia. Uh, so welcome to the coaching circle, Sonia Tadio. Wow. Hello, Tony. <laughs> Hello, Sonia. <laughs> what, a, what a greeting. Thank you. Oh, well, look, a well-deserved greeting um, because you are a woman of many talents and I've always been very inspired by you. I've learned so much from you. And, uh, and so, you know, the question I would love to ask because, you know, I know so many other coaches and practitioners and um, and people that have businesses listen to this episode. So the question I always love to ask is what led you, Sonia, to start your business and why is what you do important to you? Mm, great question, Tony. Okay. So if we think back to um, master training and there was a little segment where, you know, we can either be moving towards a goal or moving away. Okay, so I would say that the journey for my business really started with a moving away from an experience and it's transitioned to mm. moving towards. Okay, so let me just go through it a little bit. I suppose I was working for the Department for Education. Um, I loved teaching, loved the, the me being a teacher and that connection with my students. Yeah. But there were, I was quite burnt out. So after about 10 years of teaching, I was feeling um, physically burnt out. I was fe feeling emotionally burnt out. Um, and I sort of got to the point where I was like, like, I can't sustain this. I can't sustain mm. how I was feeling. So, and I was like, what do I do? Like, I love teaching. I love being a teacher. I love my connection with my students. And I worked really hard. So while I had kids, I was doing my master's in teaching. I was like, I don't want to give that all up, mm. you know, just because I was unhappy with the context of where I was working. Anyway, fast forward, I was doing one of your amazing courses. I was doing your NLP practitioner course and you were demonstrating something called the spelling technique. Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the participants got up and they started crying and they sort of um, divulged that at school they always felt really dumb. So this is her terminology. They'd always felt really dumb because they didn't know how to spell. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm a bit sad to say this, but as a teacher, like it really hit me hard and it shocked me mm. that it made me reflect. I was like, how many people leave our school system feeling less than, feeling yeah. like they can't achieve their dreams and their goals because they felt less than academically? Um, and the thing is, I know as a teacher, spelling does not, you know, whether you can read, whether you can spell, does not actually equate to your intelligence. Yes. I, yeah. It's a skill that with the right support and teaching, you learn it. It's a skill. But it, yeah. I, never in my mind have I ever equated spelling or reading with intelligence. And so in that moment, I'm like, i got to do something about this. 
<laughs> Absolutely. And Sonia, just on that, like ah. I, that, that is such a good point because every single time I run that training, NLP practitioner training, and we go through that spelling strategy, there is always an adult in the room that I can demonstrate with because they don't have a good spelling strategy. Yeah. Like, like they don't have it. So th it's quite a common issue, right? Yeah. 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 I'm not surprised because we did go through a period in education where I'll get uh, very briefly, we, we didn't actually learn spelling or reading in a very structured, explicit way. So we've got a whole bunch of people, including me, who in my later years, my adult years, I've had to acquire that knowledge and skills because I sort it out. Mm. So that's sort of probably another conversation. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing is that would you say with the school system that it doesn't necessarily, well, I don't know what it's like now. It's been a long time yeah. since I was at school. My daughter's 21, so I haven't had children yeah. in the school system, but there was definitely a time, I don't know, it's not necessarily reflected on now, but where the schools didn't really have the resources or the kind of um, structure to um, to really account for the people who had different ways of thinking or different ways of learning or different ways of anything really absolutely tony yeah and, um, look we've been through periods of i suppose practice and pedagogy that we now realize weren't really backed up by science and evidence they weren't evidence informed so we once had the premise that like oral language, we can develop that through being within our family system and mm. it will develop very naturally through, I suppose, osmosis, okay, and, and peers and extended family. When it comes to reading and spelling, we used to have this false perception that that would develop naturally. But it, we now know that that's not true, that mm. we need explicit structured teaching to develop those skills they're two very different skills mm. uh, if you think of uh, the human being and the development of humanity reading is quite a new novice if we're thinking overall within the history of humanity yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and when you yeah. look at the complexities and I, I i'm not multilingual but even yeah. just at english yeah it's a very complex language yes Yes. And how things are spelt and pronounced and how the structure of sentences are put together and those kinds of things. It's quite that's complex. It. Yeah, it is. Mm. Um, yeah. And that's why we need informed teachers. We need to empower our teachers too. So they mm. feel comfortable um, yeah. how to teach it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I and I think, you know, like you said, the negative impact that it has or the sort of you know what people think it means if they have problems spelling because like I even know my dad for example had a lot of problems with literacy when he was in school he was born in 1946 but he was yeah. left-handed they made him be right-handed um you know to this day he, he's not a good speller um mm. but it doesn't mean he wasn't intelligent he was incredible with his hands and he was a panel bidder and had his own business and did those things but what never learn the strategies to be able to master spelling and and those kinds of things yeah absolutely and look tony i think at the crux of it if you're leaving school and you're not feeling too confident about yourself you know academically and and in the back of your mind you've maybe got that um uh, negative thought pattern you know i'm dumb and you carry that on into your adulthood it's there at that unconscious level, possibly, um, mm. and it will impact the choices that you make quite yeah. possibly within, within your life and your goals and your yeah. aspirations. And you know, do you think it, it, come, it kind of links into shame as well, where people feel like that there's something wrong with them and that they've got something they've got to try to hide and cover up and all that kind of thing as well? Spot on. Mm. No shame here. Own it. If you can't spell, own it. <laughs> That's what I say. Yeah. It, it's not your fault. It's yeah. just you did not, you weren't given those opportunities and the structure that you needed at school. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing yeah. that it is strategies, it is like step-by-step -step things. There's no such thing as someone who just can't read, right? Like it's, I mean, unless there's some other particular challenges yeah. for whatever reason, but yeah. it's just learning. It's just learning the step, 
tips and the strategies. Yeah, it's spot on. And look, I think like all of us, you know, it is a skill. Some kids will get through school with crappy teaching just because they're naturally good at, you know, either read or reading or spelling. But mm. the majority of us need good quality informed teaching. Mm. Yeah. And what do you think is the influence, Sonia, on, um, you know, the home, like the home environment? Because like I know for myself, I mm. spent, when I was young, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother yeah. and she would always, she was always reading. Like whenever we went anywhere, like she often took public transport. And so we'd go on the bus with Nana. It was always fun. And wherever she went, she always had a book with her. We'd always go on trips to the library with her. Like it was just always a thing that reading was the thing, right? And, mm. and when I have my daughter, like everything that I bought her had some kind of words and pictures and things. And she had a rattle that was like a little handle with a little book. And like, it, I, it was just a natural kind of thing. But, you know, I, I guess for some people, that's not a natural environment at home, is yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. Look, there's a couple of things with that. Environment is definitely important. Um, I think if anything, your grandma, for an example, and I, I try to do the same with my girls, you're instilling the, these positive associations with books and reading. Because, like, you know, mm. for me, like reading is about curiosity. It's mm. about wonder. Like I can find out about the world through books. And sometimes yes. I can escape this hard world through books. Yes. You know? An adventure and, yeah. Um, yeah, it, like it's amazing. It's reflective of life. It's an adventure. But, look, I think, yes, you can build up positive emotions. When you're reading at home and you're surrounded by literacy and literacy experiences, you're expanding your vocab, for an example. You're expanding access to literacy um, and reading and spelling. Mm. Um, things like... The flip side of that is I really want to be clear about is if someone has something like dyslexia, mm -hmm. even if from an early age they're immersed in books and reading and literacy and all that amazing stuff within the home, they're still going to have problems even yes. when they go to school. So it's, I'm just making sure it's very clear, even if we immerse our kids in literacy, Yes. Won't mean that they won't necessarily have issues if they have something like dyslexia. Yeah, that's really interesting, Sonia, yeah. you know, because I know like I've learned, I, I certainly don't have the understanding of literacy to the extent that you have. I, I don't have any of those teaching degrees. I haven't done that specialist training at all. Um, and I know you're very, you know, very um, uh, knowledgeable in that area and experience. Um, but the one thing that I learned around um dyslexia and I guess from an NLP kind of perspective is looking at it from where kids when they're young are very much in this 3D realm mm. and then when they start looking at pages it's 2D and yeah. then sometimes the mind can try to it kind of distorts trying to make it more 3D and things and it can shift things around on the page and that kind of stuff mm. does that like sort of play into any of the like the I guess the perspectives that you've had around dyslexia and, and what happens with yeah. people? Look, what first thing I'd say is that I always want to make sure that we validate. So if someone says to me that they're when they're reading, the letters jump out or something, you know, I always want to make sure that we validate what they're saying. So okay. Yeah. First, um, what we actually know about dyslexia is that I think once upon a time we used to think that it was a visual thing. Okay. Mm, okay it, yeah. it, it's actually a phonological deficit. So what that means is phonological is your um, your ability to hear sounds in language. Okay. okay. And so if, for an example, you've got a phonological deficit, then say you're trying to learn how to read and write and our language system is all about it's a code. We have an alphabet, right? Mm. We've got 44 sounds, 26 letters. We've got to recycle those letters, put them in different patterns to create our words, right? Mm. But if you're having trouble matching the letter H, for an example, 
represents I'm trying to think of a voice sound Hang on, I'm trying to think of a uh, or if T represents t and you're not able to remember that information okay with mm -hmm. automaticity and accuracy then when it gets to blending and reading you're at a disadvantage mm. So once upon, a, I suppose what I'm getting at is it's actually a phonological. It's a it, it's the hearing right. that is crucial in dyslexia. Yeah. And so, matching, so could yeah, that sorry. be the hearing, like remembering what that sounds like as yeah. your yeah yeah. And what you find is, like people with dyslexia, they'll have very poor working memory. So, mm. um, and the best way I describe it is that with a typically developing brain, when it comes to reading. You want to get from South Australia to Northern Territory. Now, if you've got the, a typical developing brain, you'll go straight direct to that route, straight up, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got dyslexia, what happens is the neural pathways in your brain might head to Victoria and then they might head to Perth. Then they might head to Victoria again and Queensland. And then they might eventually head up to Northern Territory. Right. So it, it's actually like the neural pathway that's mm. a thing. Mm. yeah yeah wow that's really fascinating Sonia yeah. um yeah it's so and I think there's so much of this that we take for granted when we don't have a challenge yeah. in reading or spelling or or whatever yeah? yeah um but there's so much that happens that's going on in someone's mind and if yeah if any of those neural pathways aren't quite connecting up then can be a bit of chaos there going on right yeah it, it does yeah you can see it um for our kids and unfortunately what happens even with you know with some of my students with extreme dyslexia because it's a spectrum you know some yeah. will be mild some and then other some have on top of dyslexia they might have other challenges you know like as uh, autism spectrum disorder they might have adhd um mm. and what happens is their self-esteem and their confidence drops. Yes. Now that's the heartbreaking part where they start to question themselves and their ability to learn. Yes. And be, I mean, I'm excited about learning, you know. Yes. Um, it becomes a chore for them. It, Yeah, their confidence drops. Mm. Yeah. And so this is a really important part, I guess, yeah. about what you do, Sonia, isn't it? Because it's not just about teaching children these particular strategies or helping them you know to create those neural pathways or whatever else there's a lot more that you're doing around helping them with their self-esteem and and getting into that sort of coaching space um so I'd love to know Sonia a little bit more about you know what is your um I guess your way of working with people and what is it that you're focusing on and how do you how do you go about helping them restore that self-esteem and confidence yeah um look Tony it's not always easy okay but I think I think what what makes me a good teacher an effective teacher is I will always look to connect with that student so when I'm seeing them I don't just want to be seeing them as someone I'm teaching literacy to I want to really connect with who they are as a person their likes their strengths um you know their challenges all of it okay mm. so first and foremost relationship like mm. anyone um yeah that that's the most important for me and I think it's your students know when you tapped in when you genuinely care yeah um they know that they sense that yes um so that's always the first two things. I'm making sure that I'm connected. I've, I'm building that relationship. It takes time, like any relationship. Um, and, I, you know, I can't help what I, you know, I'm there predominantly for literacy. But I think through language and modelling um, and sometimes like I've got an emotions chart that I've just recently introduced for some of my children. I know they find it hard to articulate their emotions, so I've created an emotion chart. Mm. I just have conversations with them, like, you know what, as as human beings, we have a variety of emotions. Mm. And it's not all I'm happy and sad. It's 
actually, in this minute, I'm feeling angry. In this minute, I'm feeling excited. In this minute, I'm feeling joyful. So it changes. But I think yes. it's really important for our kids to articulate their emotions and connect with it. Um, yes. So, yeah. so, uh, Sonia, I, do you know what? I just love that. And even when you were saying this, and this is why I love talking to people that have expertise in other areas because it joins the dots into a lot of other things for me. And as you were talking about that, you know, I often talk about how our language is how we gauge our experience. And yeah. so if, you know, it's not just about learning words, but it's actually learning how they relate to our actual experience so yeah. that we can communicate that and, um, and, and understand that. Because I guess it, it's like, you know, the thing that's popping into my mind, I guess, is like, learning another language it's like you can if it's got letters that you can recognize you can sort of say the words but you still don't know what they're representing spot on tony comprehension yeah yes yeah you're yes. spot on that's when the brain's working so hard to decode that um often there's no room for comprehension of and connection with what you're reading mm. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, this is really fascinating, Sonia. I'm, and I think, you know, that's one of those things where when you have an unconscious competence, yeah. um, you, you just don't have awareness of, of all the sort of complexities and things that, that are there. Um, and it just, I guess it becomes, a, it just highlights how complex it is and how ridiculous it is that we just assume everyone is just going to be able to pick that up naturally. Spot on, Tony. And, uh, you know, the thing that for me, it's social justice. So if you, mm. you look at prison rates and the people that are in prison and their their literacy abilities, mm. they're low, you know, it's, they're low. So when you can't read um, or you have very minimal skills in reading or you can't spell and write, that limits your ability to function and participate as a thriving human being yeah. in society. And I agree. I take it for granted every day. I know, I know how to read and write. I've always got five books on the go, you know, but I'm also aware of those people that, that that's not accessible to them at the moment. Mm, yeah. So, yeah. I, And I, I've had a conversation <laughs> a heated conversation about someone who turned around to me and you know these were kids that were having a really tricky time at school and so they were like oh look we don't we don't we don't bother with reading um and spelling we, we're just trying to teach them life skills I was like, uh like you know cooking or shopping i'm like look reading and spelling is a life skill yeah yeah, how are you going to interpret the world and how that you get around in the world if you can't utilise the main modality of how information's transmitted? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I don't think, Tony, you know, with AI and, and spell check and things, we've still got to have a grasp of our language before mm. we can actually successfully use that technology even in spell check we've got to know at least the first two three letters before spell check will come up with the rest of the word for us or you know texting or whatever it is mm. um yeah 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 okay fascinating fascinating so so is there anything else Sonia that like you'd like to share with us about you know how you work with people or you know what like what are the key things that maybe someone could recognize in their themselves or their um, children that would um, I guess indicate that that, that they maybe um, need some extra support yeah look it it can happen really quick like very early on you can start detecting things for things are not developing quite the right way um, what they found is you know, for, and I'll keep going to dyslexia because that's sort of my specialty. But if your child, for an example, is delayed in their milestones when it comes to oral development and how many words they should be saying by a certain age, I'm not saying it's definitely something's not right, but you be aware and empowered as a parent that that could be an indicator 
that things are not developing as they should. Okay. Mm. Um, then look, when we head into sort of kindy age as a teacher, uh, kids that are maybe struggling with rhyming or alliteration. So alliteration is where, you know, snake, Sonia, sausage, things that all begin with the same sound. Mm -hmm. um, syllables, if they, they can't quite develop the skill of syllables, they're all indicators as a teacher that, okay, maybe maybe things are not developing right. Mm. But when you get to school, really important indicators are if your child is really struggling to make connections between these letters and their sounds, and you'll know it because what will happen is they'll be like, they'll recognise the letter T on one page or the word sat on one page, and then you might get to the next page and they're back to not recognising that word, that letter, that sound. Okay, okay. yeah. So we, we all need time to consolidate those mm. patterns, but it's usually quite slow and laborious for those children who are ma not making those connections. Mm. It's not, not sort of happening at that typical rate. Yeah. Yeah. And and on this, Sonia, yeah. um, this is a bit of a loaded question, but is it <laughs> ever too late is it ever too late to develop your literacy skills? You know what, Tony? I'm an, look, it's all about perspective. Um, I never say never. Like, don't ever tell me I can't do something because I'm going to do it, right? Yeah. So what I do say is that um, in our beautiful ideal world where everything happens with rainbows and unicorns, mm -hmm. it, you know, really we get onto these things as soon as we can because mm. of early intervention as teachers we all know Early intervention is paramount, right? Mm. Best outcomes. However, I would say to the adult that is struggling with reading, get out there. Like, do it. Do what you can. I, like, for example, I'm learning Italian now. Um, being Italian background, we always, I could always speak it, but I, um, but I could, or sorry, I could always understand it, but I couldn't necessarily respond back um I couldn't write Italian very well so like when did I start maybe in my 40s so most people would say well why would you want to learn a new skill in your 40s and I might not ever get to where someone else is that started in their early years but I don't care I'm going to keep at mm. it and I'm going to do what I can and learn what I can mm. so yes early years is amazing but we can start at any time yeah and do you work with people who are, you know, have mature age? Uh, I have. <laughs> yes. And it challenged me because I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to have to learn some this different This is different, things. yeah. <laughs> I, I won't be able to sing to them and, you know. Um, <laughs> that was, yeah, maybe that was, you could. Yeah, they look at me a bit strange. Um, <laughs> look, I, I had the fortunate experience. I've had a couple of um, boys that I've worked with they were, one was 16, one was 17, yep, 17. He is dyslexic, thinking of one specifically. He had a goal to get into the police force. Mm. I know his mum, mum, Sonia, can you please help my son? So, look, he, clever boy, really dedicated, knew what he wanted and was willing to, do what it took because he failed the the written exam to get into the force right yeah right? and he knew he had to do something about it so mm. they sought out my services I think we only worked together for about a year but he did it like he's wow. one of the youngest graduates that he's basically finished year 12 and then went straight into the force and he passed his test so really? I, did, I did love that experience because he had self-motivation. He knew what he wanted to do. Yes. Um, so, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's amazing. I love that. I love that. And, you know, and I think one of the things, Sonia, that I, I would love to know a bit about, and I think, you know, because I'm very passionate about NLP, which is all about language and mindset and communication and things like that in different different way, lots of crossovers though, I'm sure. Um, but I'm so passionate about other specialists and practitioners and, and therapists and things like that, learning NLP because of how much it um, supports and enhances pretty much anything that you do. 
Um, yeah. So I would love if you could share with us a little bit about how NLP has helped you, um, I guess, personally and as a business owner and in what it is that you do with your um, clients. Yeah. Oh, look, Tony, it, it's been huge. It's made an, a huge impact on my life. Um, and I suppose the number one thing, being very honest here, was it's helped me change the internal dialogue. So mm -hmm. we all know that what you're saying to yourself, whether you can, whether you can't do something, uh, it, 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 um, it changes your experience of mm -hmm. life. So number one for me, going through it myself, it's helped me change my internal dialogue. Okay? Yeah. And I think the most impactful thing that I can do for my students is help them change their internal dialogue. Mm. Yeah. So what you tell yourself, how you speak to yourself, you're challenging your negative thoughts, challenging your belief systems. These are all things I've had to do and keep doing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's but a work in progress, right? It's a work in progress. Um, but, geez, you know, for our kids, how empowering is it for them? Even something like, you know, oh, I can't do this yet. You know, just, yeah. adding, just flipping it ever so slightly. I think that once we, we can master that internal dialogue, speaking to ourselves with, like we would to a friend, with encouragement, being supportive towards ourselves, we can get through challenges. Yes. Much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Break and, oh, absolutely. And there's so much in there about, yeah, focusing on what you want, being at core, taking responsibility for your outcomes, um, understanding, yeah, what those words are as a suggestion to yourself. Yeah. Uh, how, you know, oh, there's so much there. That is so great, um, Sonia. And I think, you know, especially like when you're moving from a job into business, and this is what I want to talk about now, because that's a challenging transition. And I know that for you, Sonia, there was a time you, you had no kind of plans of being having your own business, right? No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what do you think is for you has been, I, you know, one of the most challenging things? And I like asking people this because, you know, often when we're in business and we see other people on the socials and we think everybody's got it sorted out and, you know, da, da, da. Like what's been the most challenging thing in business for you and how have you dealt with it? Oh, my God. Hang on, hang on, wait for my list. Okay. <laughs> it, it, is, it has changed at, at so many levels because you evolve and change and then you're like, oh, now I've got to cross this challenge. I think first and foremost, I was how I viewed myself. I viewed myself as a teacher and I am just a teacher. That is my role. Just um, a so teacher. Then, That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Just a teacher. And I know how to do teacher things really well. But don't ask me to work on my finances. Yeah. That's boring. Um, so, look, that honestly, that was a big thing for me, was budgeting yeah. finances, you know, being aware of what I earned. And, and mm. as a teacher, I was always at wherever, office works, buying resources, we're addicted to it. But really, honestly, seeing myself, taking myself seriously as I am a business person, I am in business, mm. um, and I am doing a great service and I need to be profitable. So how am I going to make myself profitable? So yeah. working on finances was number one. Uh, probably the next big challenge was visibility, which I know a lot of our friends in our community is a big yeah. one. Like imposter syndrome. Who am I? Who am I to talk about literacy? And you know what? Who I am? I'm just someone who started off. I'm continuing to learn um i don't know everything about literacy but god damn it i'll keep learning and being curious and do the stuff that i need to do so i can best support my students and my parents um yeah and i think yeah. on that is that that's yeah. that thing isn't it is everyone feels like everyone is a big generalization but people get into that thing of going i don't know everything that there is to know so yeah. how can i possibly help someone well because you know a whole bucket load more than the people that you're helping yeah 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 and yeah. when you need to know more you you can learn more yeah 
Yeah, but I think that's a good one for people to have awareness that it, like so many people have that I don't know enough. I haven't learned. I don't know everything there is to know. Someone could ask me a question that I don't know the answer to. Like none what? of that is a reason not to go out and help people. Could you imagine who would ever get helped if everyone believed that they had to know absolutely everything there was to know until they could help someone else? We'd all be at home watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah, because no one could read. <laughs> yeah. I, look, I do remember one of my teachers, Bill Hansberry, saying, get uncomfortable. And I think you've done this too. You've taught me this too, Tony. Get uncomfortable with hanging out with people who know more than you. Yes. And it's like, I, I and I can honestly say that I am more comfortable now because I know that I learn. They, they raise me and they inspire me. I can't honestly say that I don't like feeling confident all the time because I do. I like that feeling. But it doesn't let me stop me from hanging out with people who are more confident or doing those courses. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm much, I'm okay to admit that I, I don't know everything. Oh, yes. Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and, and the funny thing about this, this is so funny, uh, Sonia, is that we get into that, oh, I don't want everyone to you know people to know that I don't know everything but yeah. then if you come across someone like, like you ever come across those people and you go oh my god they just think they, they know everything yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be around them. no <laughs> yeah no yeah oh that's so funny so yeah so visibility finances um you know who am I all that sort of stuff they're they're common challenges right in going yeah. in business that look business will force you it's a conduit for development big time yes it's not com it's not comfortable tony um however it's freedom like it's freedom and it's empowering yeah yeah it's it's so true isn't it because um and, and i think you know one of the things on you is that today people are so conditioned to be comfortable yeah. the moment they feel the slightest bit of di discomfort it's yeah. like oh my god I've you know I've got to have a sick day I've got anxiety I've got you know you, yeah. like there's just labels for any slightest bit of discomfort and not discrediting there are people in real discomfort but I think people are so conditioned that everything should just be warm and cozy and comfortable and it doesn't require too much exertion or anything else but that that's not where growth happens that's not what people are designed for like we don't evolve unless we put ourselves into environments that create a little bit of stress for us because that mm -hmm. stress is what creates your your mind going okay i need a new coping mechanism mm -hmm. develop neurology to be able to make my way in this environment and and that's business that's that's anything it's like moving out of that like you know people talk about the com com comfort zone yeah. I always say it's more the familiar zone right it's just yeah. what you're familiar with it's not necessarily comfortable yeah but yeah but like I agree Sonia it's definitely I think business is is one of the number one things that will highlight where you've got some personal growth to do oh yes it will thank it you is. yes you know what Tony you're Which right is a we don't we don't get sick days, do we? It's you know you know as a business owner, you, things are going on in your life and personal life. You don't get to make that phone call and say, "I'm sorry, I can't come in today." You you've got to build on that resilience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and it's interesting because I someone I spoke to um, recently on an interview said same thing about freedom, and she kind of laughed. She goes, "Freedom? Well, it's a different kind of freedom because you've got these responsibilities, but you've got the freedom." to do what's aligned with your values and your morals and what you're passionate about helping and who you choose to work with and all of those kinds of things and, um, you know, really being able to decide anytime you can go, well, I want to go in this direction with my yeah. business and you've got the freedom to do that, right? It's fun, isn't it? Yes, yes, amazing. So, well, on the flip side, Sonia, what, do you, what would you say is the most rewarding thing about having your own business? Yeah, um exactly what you just said Tony for me my number one thing is that it's freedom and I get to you know I get to be the captain of my ship and I get to say how my business evolves um, look in the beginning I was a bit like oh I better do this this is what my clients want and I'm gonna but these days I'm like actually 
this is how I want my business to run and this is what I'm going to put out there and it's kind of like they've got to sort of mould around my boundaries and my structures yes. within the business. Um, and it's it's I've, I'm accountable to myself. I, I do like that. I need that. I need to be mm. accountable to myself. I've got a high level of agency. I'm a highly motivated person. Um, and I enjoy exercising that. Mm. Yeah, and that um, and that ability to be myself uh, authentically, um, yeah. and, and let that lead and change with my business. Yeah, yeah, I love that, Sonia. I, love and that. I don't like anyone telling me what to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> myself. Oh, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. Absolutely. I think that was one of my my biggest drivers when I first went into business was I don't want anyone telling me where I have to yeah. be, what days yeah. I have to work, what time, what hours, what how much they're going to pay me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, oh, that's great. I love it. Mm. I love it. And um, and you've done that really well. I've I've been you know really inspired by you and the business acumen that you've taken on and what you've developed for yourself and what you've grown. I think you know you've been a really great role model in that space, Sonia. So, um, well done. Thank now, you. Yes, and Good mentoring. Um, Lots of beautiful mentors. I do. Yeah, I, I think me. that's that's yeah. such the thing, isn't it? I think you know, really one of those things about being in business is great. And I, I know I've had that experience as well. It's the people that have come before me and helped guide me and role model that have helped me in what I've done. And then I know, you know, it helps. Then I, it's the outflow, right? People that I help and the people that they help. And mm, it's exciting. Yeah. You meet some very interesting people. Like I've just yes. gone, wow, you're doing that as a business. Like that is amazing. It's really fascinating people yes yeah. yes it is it's so like think people with uh who run businesses often have very different ways of thinking yeah it's but yeah it is it's incredible um so Sonia I'd love to bring it back to you know just you know what you're doing and who you help and is there something that you'd you know like people to know about working with um, someone like yourself, specialist in literacy or dyslexia, that could really help them make a life-changing decision? What would be the one thing that you'd want people to know that could help them make a decision like that? Um, look, what I, and what I'm trying to do with my social media as well, and I will get there, is I, I really want to empower parents. There's a couple of ways I want to empower parents. When they're looking for support, for their child what is it that you need to look out for a parent to make sure that the tutor the intervention specialist is qualified to actually do that so mm -hmm. I always say don't be afraid to ask questions you know you're ringing up for a tutor and intervention specialist can you tell me what your background is? What are your qualifications? What what are your um, extra studies that you've done? How long have you been working with children with whatever, dyslexia, whatever it might be? So mm. be informed. I think the issue is sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So sometimes you actually don't know what questions to ask. Yeah. It's quite overwhelming to try and actually find someone to work with your child with literacy, um, in literacy. So ask questions. Ask those uncomfortable questions. Yeah. Okay. Great. And so for people, I think that's a really good uh, that's a really good point, Sonia, because I think sometimes people feel like when they're making inquiries that they're a bit on the back foot. But it's like, no, you need to be able to. It's within your rights to ask and inquire and make sure that you're finding the right person for your needs, right? Spot on. Yeah. Great. And so on that, Sonia, what's the best way? How can people get in touch with you? I know I'll, you've given me links. I'll pop them all into the show notes. So definitely go to the show notes to check out the links to contact Sonia. But what's generally the best way people get in touch with you? Uh, look, definitely my website is the best way because if they want to have a chat with me, there's like a 15-minute call that yeah. they can do to book it. Get on um, and ask all those hard questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I like supporting that. Um, yeah. I am, will have 
soon a product that where people can spend a whole hour with me a bit like a consultant yes. and parents will be able to ask me whatever questions they want about concerns that they might be having about their child's literacy um what questions might be helpful to ask teachers or other allied help health professionals how they can help their child at home possibly yeah. um so I am developing that and that should be coming soon. Um, or you can just call me. And if I'm working with someone, I will call you as soon as I can. Fabulous. Yeah. So, yeah, so website is www.support2excel.com. Um, the link will be in the uh, show notes. Go and check out um, Sonia's uh, website. And, you know, if you know anyone else that may have those needs or if children have needs or whoever, adults even, um, you know, definitely share this with them because you just never know how much you may change someone's life by, you know, helping sharing some information with them. So, um, Sonia, I'm so thrilled. Thank you so much for having coming on and sharing and, you know, being so generous with your time and knowledge in this area because I think it's something that, you know, a lot of people don't have a lot of awareness of and it is such a powerful thing. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And I would love to know, just to wrap up, because uh, I know when we get into business, for some people, it can become all consuming and we're just like business night and day. Um, but I know you're very good with your boundaries around your life and, and those kinds of things. So when you're not in your business, Sonia, what do you love to do for fun? I think the question is, what do I not do, Tony? <laughs> um, okay, I, <laughs> I study Italian. So, um, and look, I'm probably a bit more chillaxed about it this year, but before I would study every day, half an hour a day, but now I just pretty much rock up to my classes. I love language. So I love learning language. Mm. Um, I love being out in nature. Like nature is what grounds me and centers me. Love going out on hikes. Um, I love hanging out with my family. I love my garden. Something has happened to me in the last couple of years. I've enjoyed I like gardening these days. I genuinely love my garden. So I love being out in the soil. Um, what else do I like? I'm reading. I'm forever reading. Love reading. Uh, cooking. <laughs> I'm always cooking too. Um, I'm making my own apple cider at the moment. So I'm always kind of wow. experimenting and, and doing something. Um, but, yes, you're right, Tony. And, and it's, it's definitely a journey. But it's learning. I think the biggest thing for me, and this is what I was not able to get with the Department for Education, is that I am a whole person. I am a business person. I am a person who likes leisure. I do have interests and hobby. I love my friends connecting with family. I am a whole person and mm. I need to make sure that um, I spend my time yes. doing those things as a complete whole person. Yeah. Yes, because you have your, I remember your focus, it's like being um, sustain, slow, sustainable, soulful living, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah, which I really love. I really love that so much, Sonia. And um, I said, I always learn so much from you and everything that you do. And I'm sure that we could keep talking for a long time. And often we do. <laughs> <laughs> We will wrap up for this episode, Sonia. So thank you again so much for coming on. Um, you know, you shared so much wonderful uh, information and you're always such a pleasure as well. So thank you so much. Can I just say before I go, Tony, I've got yes. to say that I just want to thank you because, you know, I met you at Toastmasters um, and I was like, oh, who is this lady? You know, like <laughs> I... I I appreciate, and, and I know you're on your journey as well, but I just appreciate you showing up and being your best self and your authentic self and you keep working at it and you keep growing and it's exciting to see you evolve and grow. And when you do that, you give permission to other people, even though they may, they may not say it, but you're giving permission to other people to, to be their best. You're like, oh, I could do that too. I could be happy and joyful and live with purpose so thank you for being you thank you Sonia I really appreciate that you're a true treasure <laughs> thank you Tony <laughs>